Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here today for the OICE. I have to say I'm very impressed with the difficult topics you're bringing up today and discussing with uh, your members and equally uh, government. Uh, it's, I will only wish that our equivalent of the AIA and RIBA would tackle some of these difficult situations that we have. So again, I applaud everyone here that's uh, taking part of these discussions. Um, and thank you for the introduction. I think I'm probably the more light-hearted entertainment for this, uh, this event. I'm not taking on the tough topics that uh, is being discussed, but uh, something in which was um, discussed was really how we work as a collaborative practice. Uh, hopefully most people are aware of who SOM are, um, but we are very much a practice that is an architectural and engineering practice, working as a design practice, not um, acting as just an architectural practice or just an engineering practice. And that's really what we focus our efforts on. And um, I'll bore you with a couple of black and white photographs of just explaining how our practice uh, has moved on. And the three partners, uh, originally there was actually two, there was Skidmore and there was Owings. Um, and they actually started the practice in Europe. They, uh, they met in uh, Paddington Station in London when they were on a European tour and they were both headed to Chicago, where there was a century of progress that was taking place. And uh, they decided to set up a practice together, realizing there was just a gap in the market where there wasn't anyone really bringing people together to solve difficult problems. And so there was a lot of chaos early on in the century of progress, and both Skidmore and Owings saw the opportunity that architecture and engineering needed to come together and find uh, answers to difficult solutions. And that's where um, Merrill, who is the engineer, came on board and really um, started to make this a very interesting practice and something that was new in the United States as far as merging these two disciplines. And it wasn't so much the first generation that you would remember SOM for, it was really the, the framework that was set up by those initial partners that actually created the creativity within the second generation, third generation, and fourth generation of partners. Um, I think Gordon Bunshaft would probably summarize our practice where a Pritzker Prize winning architect can come from a very large multidisciplinary practice recognized for the architecture in which he uh, created. And equally, there was a great partnership that was created uh, with Foz Khan. Hopefully someone's familiar with Foz Khan's work and Bruce Graham of developing some of the most um, complicated and world's tallest uh, towers, still some of the tallest today. And again, we are a practice of just specialists. We are able to work with the very best in the world. We're quite spoiled in the ability of bringing people together for difficult projects. And they can be across the globe. And again, the BIM modeling is part of that. We work um, from day one, and we rely on our consultants who we engage with to also be working in BIM because it's a communication tool. So it can bridge across difficult languages. Uh, it can, it's actually, we, the model speaks for itself and allows for everyone to work competently uh, to move projects forward. Um, another aspect that I'd like to make clear is that we're not wanting to be the largest multidisciplinary practice. We want to become the best design practice in the world. And therefore, we have four key design offices. You can see in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, London, um, and then we have support offices that help uh, deal with localized projects with our work in Asia and the Middle East, um, which are really more of a support um, status of those um, larger offices. And this is worth spending some time on. We are a practice that is dedicated to architecture. Uh, it leads about 50% of uh, everyone within the office. And a very small but effective group within that is our uh, 90 structural engineers that we have. Uh, we work quite closely together. Uh, if we're the right arm, our structural engineers are very close and our left hand that brings very difficult projects together. And within our London office, we're around um, 80 people. Uh, again, the, the chart generally works the same as it does in overall office where we're led by architects. And then again, we have a strong structural engineering group that supports that along with planners and an interior design, and, uh, sustainability and other specialists. And we also like to be a very diverse group. Um, just within the London office, you can see that our pie chart is quite um, split up. Um, our Italian contingency is strong. 
probably the fifth largest in our, our office. Uh, again, some of our strongest designers as well come from Italy, so thank you for that um, export. Um, and that really allows us to create large, difficult projects. And I think what we really enjoy from a practice is that we build our, our pro projects. We don't like just designing them. We like to solve problems early on and find solutions for our clients with our consultants, uh, making cost-effective and design solutions to, to realize our projects. And again, we'll take on any project. It's a matter of each project we take on, and maybe that's something from today that you've taken through, is how we evolve as a practice and how we continually challenge buildings in, in our environment. Um, the Hodge Terminal, which is, can take 80,000 people at any one time, is a completely open air uh, airport. And thinking about that in the 1970s and 80s is a very difficult challenge of all of the airport security and things that you realize. And equally, taking that airport design and realizing new ways of interpreting that with Singapore and creating a very interesting way in which you're uh, connected with your environment. And that goes on to say that we, we see architecture as something that's timeless, something that doesn't get judged on a weekly basis. It's something that gets established, and I think there should be more of these um, awards that you get for a 25 or a 50 year award for buildings. Um, SOM has uh, been able to achieve uh, the most AIA 25 year awards, which are some of the buildings that you see here, which um, dealt with very difficult problems very early on, um, whether it be the Hancock Tower, which was the first mixed use high rise tower to again, uh, the King Abdul Aziz Airport in Jeddah. But we look again for the future and really reestablishing in this continual idea of recreating ourselves into uh, new architecture and new ideas with the buildings that we're building today. Um, and we really like to be seen by our peers that we're leading the industry. And I think one thing that we've done very interesting is that we've actually let other people judge our work rather than uh, assembling our work and <laughs> producing this. So we actually have outside critics that actually critique our work and we have an annual book that represents that. And I think it really comes down to our practice is the strength of our collaboration and bringing everyone together in all of our different disciplines under one simple way of working as a group um, and one that really brings the best out in everyone. So we think there are strengths with design, technical, and management within any of those disciplines coming together to deal with very difficult projects. And just to quickly talk about some projects that we're looking at, we're taking on the Great Lakes, which is a water body that represents 22% uh, of the world's fresh water. Um, it's 80% of North America's fresh water and there's no one that's looking after it. And so we have taken on this as a challenge from both an ecology point of view and equally finding ways in which we can strengthen the whole area and looking at high-speed rail that can connect both Canada with um, the states and finding ways to actually bridge gaps and actually look at this as being an international park. Uh, that's just a wide-ranging project that we might take on as a, just a challenge, looking beyond just the the obvious master planning project, but looking at very difficult problems that we look to solve. And we actually look to collaborate with anyone who's interested in this um, as it's a pro bono project for our office, but finding ways in which we can engage with individuals to solve some of these larger problems and issues. And again, um, architecture that's notable architecture, um, currently finishing uh, One World Trade Center, as we've already completed Seven World Trade Center for a very difficult project in a diff difficult site. Um, rewriting the fire codes that exist so the same issue will not happen again if um, such a tragedy were to strike twice. Um, but taking on those challenges and working with government and municipalities to solve difficult problems. And equally, as we see pressing times ahead, we are also trying to push the industry in sustainable design. And that equally comes back to uh, BIM modeling and ways in which we can actually work with criteria um, long after the building is built and looking at how the building performs over time. And again, another project, probably more for our structural engineers in the audience, we are looking at a tower that's a 42-story wood tower, um, one in which deals with architecture, engineering, and sustainability, and finding uh, solutions for that. Our client was actually the Soft uh, Lumber Association from North America as an initial project. And again, we specifically didn't show the architecture. We wanted the engineering to be judged separately to that of the architecture. So just one of the many projects we're looking at. 
And other things, uh, as an engineering point of view, we do a lot of the work for Frank Gehry. It isn't something we necessarily promote, but it was something we've uh, had a long-standing relationship with, and we're able to solve very um, difficult issues, and it came down to BIM modeling that we were using computers much earlier than everyone else and finding innovative ways to uh, fabricate and build very difficult geometries. Um, and it's a practice that, yes, uh, if anyone's building the tallest building in the world, we're very interested in that, but equally, we like very small projects as well that um, um, are giving back to their community and finding different ways in which to uh, solve these problems. Uh, again, our legacy with engineering is important, uh, dating back from the Hancock Tower and other great classics to the Sears Tower, which Foscon. I think this chart's interesting. Uh, apply a year ago, um, SOM, uh, was able to build six of the 12 tallest buildings. But you can see how fast China is moving, that uh, it's now moved uh, six of the world's 15 tallest buildings in just one year. So it is amazing just to see how small the world is getting and just how quickly things are being developed and built. There we go. But I think for us, it's really about how we deliver buildings. And from the initial idea that someone has is actually looking at the opportunity of how we'll solve that problem, whether that be for the client, uh, whether that be for cost measures. But for us, it's not just about a beautiful drawing that you create. It's actually the creation of the, uh, the object itself and finding ways to solve these very early on and working very quickly with our engineers to solve these problems. So I think where we get it wrong, I think in the architectural industry is that we have a bad attitude of potentially uh, this expression that sometimes is just make it work, where we have very grand ambitions of architecture, but very quickly realize without checking with costs or engineering solutions that in reality, uh, the design can die very quickly. And I think it's something that we have to take on and, and be much more effective as a group, as a communication tool, and reaching out to both architects and engineers uh, to really make wonderful architecture and solve some of the world's problems that we currently have. So what we were trying to propose is the idea of really finding these great challenges as catalysts for great ideas. So I'm gonna quickly just talk about some of the projects where I'm currently working on and ones that I think are always engaging architecture in a way in which we work and just maybe sharing these ideas with you. Uh, one of these was a competition in Paris where the site was virtually unbuildable with the exception that there was a 12 meter by 24 meter um, site where actually the building could be placed and the rest of it couldn't touch the ground. So what you can see in blue was the ability you could build, everything else couldn't be touched. So from day one was really a conversation with engineers to find solutions. The result was not touching anything except for a small area which allowed for the core to rise up rather quickly and then looking at how it could solve some of the ground level problems of lifting and then actually from a top-down construction, looking at how the building was hung from the core of that 12 by 24 meter, um, uh, basically long column, that then was able to hang these tension rods down and hold the floor up to a columnless structure. Sorry. Um, again, and this was within the first month, we were already looking at engineering solutions of how to solve this and equally find solutions for the client of why this would be something that they would entertain and they never had seen a building being able to be on this site previously. Um, and the opportunities in which that led to columnless space as well. So again, the construction sequence we were talking about, again, in six weeks of looking how we actually could build something as difficult as this and looking at the steel structure at the top of the building and then how the floors would actually be built after that hanging from this. I'll move quickly as I know there's time. Another project that we're on site and building today is in Geneva uh, by FITIX headquarters. Um, we won the competition at the end of 2009 and it was something that was zoned for half the height and again we had to engage engineers almost immediately by lifting up a courtyard building to create an open space for the public and allow for this building to really be a bridge. So the initial concept was a courtyard building that was lifted up in two corners and only touching the ground in two places. Um, Roughly, a cantilever exists with about 80 meters on one side and 65 meters in the other direction um, to allow for what is really a bridge construction that wraps the whole building. Um, we're currently on site, uh, looking to be completed uh, by early part of two 2015. Um, and again, taking on a lot of BIM challenges uh, as well. All of this 
from day one was really working in a 3D modeling system and being shared with all of our consultants. And taking on very difficult environmental issues with how the building performs, but equally we created a new window wall system that we could have a very sustainable glass wall system. And uh, these are just some early construction shots that are on site as of about a month ago. And again, we've been lucky enough to also do the interiors within this as well. Um, it's worth stepping a little bit back in time uh, and looking at Broadgate Tower, which is one of the, originally one of the few towers that were able to be built um, as St. Paul's always is protected in view corridors. We have the opportunity to look with British land to develop this tower site. Um, but for those who don't know it, it's a railway station that has 12 lines that come through London and had to find really interesting solutions to build on areas where there were railways. So these are all air rights buildings. Uh, one of the key buildings is Exchange House, which is a 75 meter span with these four parabolic arches that hold the whole building. These are some of the construction shots that, again, without engineering engagement from day one to realize if a building could be built. Um, this would have been impossible uh, to really visualize. And then we've come back since the idea of height in London has been um, alleviated. We're looking at also tall buildings, and this is our current headquarters where we have our offices. Built for a building that was actually a low rise, a structural raft was built, um, only to be, this is the railway that it was built over, the rafted over. And so it took about a year and a half to build the raft but actually it was built for a 14-story building. And through the evolution of what was happening in planning in London, we actually found the opportunity where a 36-story tower could be placed, but then didn't necessarily have a structural solution of how that could happen. So we were able to actually work with our structural engineers to find a solution that the structural raft is the large red horizontal. And looking at a way, we created an exoskeleton for the tower in which then transfers its A-frame that brings these columns down in six locations on the site, which otherwise wouldn't have been possible. Sorry. And again, just a very simple um, idea about how those six columns that you see at the base come down and actually are able to be transferred down uh, between two railway lines. And again, it was the first of its kind as well as always looking at how we could innovate and make things more efficient. Because it was such a small site, uh, this was the first European double-decker lift, now something that's seen quite regular uh, within the last four years. Again, you can just see some of these construction uh, images on site. And again, those one of the six struts that you see here uh, coming into uh, Liverpool Street Station. And then I'll leave on the last one, which in London today, the housing crisis, it's uh, one of the few European cities that's growing at quite a large rate. Uh, there's an influx by 2030 that 800,000 people will be coming into London uh, and nowhere to really house them. So we've been looking at a lot of residential, which is something 15 years ago we didn't do much of. And now we'd like to think that we're leading the industry in some of the housing that's being created today. Um, we had a, on the Olympic site, for Manhattan Loft Gardens was a site that was given a zoning envelope, but we actually needed to create open space as part of the requirements within the planning process. So we actually carved out space within the tower itself to create these large open spaces for uh, the residents. And immediately, again, working with engineers to find these solutions of actually how we could cantilever the building uh, and also become quite a striking piece of architecture as well as a result. So what you can see is the hotel at the lower level and then a 42-story tower above, which is carved out by these large open spaces, creating a lot of structural issues early on. Um, equally, it has a lot of three-dimensional spaces within the building, so each apartment has a different three-dimensional space to that. So you can kind of see from the left-hand images what we were doing uh, to create more interesting apartments. And I'll just quickly, to end on, talk through the sequence of how we will actually go about this. And again, this was done in the early planning phases where we looked at how the slip form core could come up and be built in one segment of buildings. And then the slip form temporarily removed in order to build in a uh, structural uh, uh, deck and then allow for the next slip form to go up. And again, a similar situation where temporarily removed that for the next 
transfer structure to come across. And again, to justify the costs, the transfer structures became inhabitable. So those are equally where apartments and residences are all in there to help justify the cost of this particular structural solution. I think I'm going over my time, so I'll move quite quickly. And again, I think the result is a great piece of architecture with three-dimensional space. We're not just looking to make an apartment building, but actually make something that's going to last for a lifetime and be able to kind of really create interesting spaces and interesting architecture, all working with engineering and consultants to resolve this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson.